Hello all, welcome to the show. I'm Gus Gagliardi and this is Fire Code Tech. On Fire Code Tech, we interview fire protection professionals from all different careers and backgrounds in order to provide insight and a resource for those in the field. My goal is to help you become a more informed fire protection professional. Fire Code Tech has interviews with engineers and researchers, fire marshals, and insurance professionals, and highlights topics like codes and standards, engineering systems, professional development, and trending topics in the industry. So if you're someone who wants to know more about fire protection or the fascinating stories of those who are in the field, you're in the right place. Hello all, welcome to episode 64 of Fire Code Tech. On this episode, we have Matt King. Matt is a associate of mine and we've worked together in the past. Matt is a fire protection designer who has graduated from the fire protection and safety technology program at Oklahoma State. Matt shares his great wisdom from his time and internships as a student at OSU. Matt also gives insight to the big tasks and challenges of becoming a fire protection designer and what you can expect and tips for how to learn better and find a mentor. Big shout out to Matt for coming on this episode. I sure enjoyed talking with him. He is someone who has a bright future in the fire and life safety industry. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and follow us on social media. Hope you guys enjoy the episode. Now let's hear from Matt King. Well, hello, Matt. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on Fire Code Tech. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome, man. Well, um, I just wanted to get started with telling the listeners a little bit about how you found fire and life safety. Um, so my path into it was kind of bumpy in the start. So I, my mom was a uh, chemical engineer and environmental health and safety uh, specialist that throughout my life that's that's what i got to see she worked at chemical facilities and even to this day she still works at a chemical facility um and so i never really thought anything of it and i really found a respect for it when i was in high school i played football for a really long time and uh, i ended up having a really traumatic injury to my leg which actually took me out of football well, at the time, I was actually involved in a vocational school that prepared uh, high school students to go into what was called Houston Fire Academy. And right when you graduated, you went right into academy, and then uh, you went through another like eight month training for your EMT, and you were a certified firefighter EMT. Um, at the time, my mom was still a chemical engineer, and she looked at me and she said, "Hey, what if we pair that with engineering?" I said sure you know i never really thought i was cut out for college i thought well if it doesn't work i'll just go back to firefighting and so we ended up going and re- researching schools and uh, found oklahoma state went and visited it once <laughs> and uh that was the only school i applied to only school i got accepted to and then the fire protection program was the only only thing i graduated from in terms of oklahoma state so that's awesome, man. Good to hear about that you had an interest in it from an early age and got exposed and as part of that vocational program. That sounds pretty cool. What did, Do you feel like you learned things from that program that you carry through with you now that influenced the way you look at fire protection engineering? Um. Yeah, actually I do. Um, so one of the biggest impacts was our teachers were actual either retired Houston firefighters or active Houston firefighters who worked very closely with the Houston fire Academy. Um, and something I realized was that they were very well, um, ingrained with their training. They, they knew when they rolled up on scene, they had to do this, this, and this, and they didn't, I think one thing that they didn't think about were the systems that were in the building. Um, And I kind of saw that as a fire protection engineer or fire protection designer, it's our duty not only to protect the people in the building, but to also provide firefighters with the proper tools so that they can focus on their job. Um, I think it's one of the, one of the aspects that isn't really talked about much is how we are, 
we work together, but sometimes not as closely as we think. <laughs> That's true, man. It uh, seems like that is a point that is felt on both sides of, you know, for the fire service and for the fire protection engineers, this little bit of a disconnect between the two groups and needing to be more coordinated. So that's a good point you bring up. But I wanted to um, ask next about your time in the FPST program and, you know, what you thought about that program after you made your way in and you had a little bit of experience. But yeah, what did you think about Oklahoma State's um, FPST program? I truly, you know, it was a love-hate relationship. <laughs> um, at, at times, it was really difficult for me because I'm a very visual, hands-on learner. Um, if I can put my hands on it and move it and turn it and pull it apart and put it back together, I will remember it for the rest of my life. Um, but it, it, some of the conceptual stuff was difficult for me to understand. Uh, and so... There, there were times that were struggles, but as a whole, I mean, the program kind of changed my life. It really gave me a different perspective on one, kind of how buildings are built, what jobs were out there, what opportunities I had for myself even um, when I graduated. You know, graduating, I was like, yes, I, I can do this. You know, I, I've passed this first milestone and now I've got something that I worked really hard for that nobody can really take away from me. Um, and so my time at OSU was, was a blast. Uh, the professors were incredible and supportive. Um, even you've had some of them on here, uh, Dr. Agnew and, and Dr. Charter, uh, just incredible professors who really showed that they cared about their students. You, you could feel it and that they cared about your learning. Yeah. And that, that was a really incredible aspect of, of the program. Yeah, I totally agree. That's awesome. Yeah, I definitely feel similar to you about um, just being a visual learner. And, you know, sometimes in some of those courses like fire dynamics or some of the more um, high-minded conceptual courses, that I definitely had a hard time you know, in different classes as well, but really enjoyed it. So um, what were some of your favorite classes when you're in the program? Um, a truthful, smoke and vent. <laughs> I loved smoke and vent, um, learning kind of how to, or the, the basics and really the roots of smoke control systems. Um, and kind of, I really loved seeing how, you know, we always hear about how a lot of individuals in our profession come from some kind of mechanical background. And when you take smoke and vent, you're combining a little bit of HVAC design with a fire protection concept. And so I thought it was really cool to make that connection and see really why there are a lot of individuals in our profession that come from HVAC and, and be really successful. Um, but that that was overall one of my favorite classes. I loved doing all the designs and, and learning about HVAC systems and how to pair that with our understanding of how fire behaves and um, what it's going to do in terms of the design. So that was probably one of my favorites. Um, occupational safety was also one of my favorites. I, I really loved that class with uh, Professor Stockel, uh, another amazing professor who who cared about her students but oc safety was another one where you got to see why safety matters in industrial facilities and you know she she would preach that you've got to be able to communicate to people why they should do it and not just tell someone that they should do it <laughs> so that that was also a really cool class that's a good point man yeah awesome well, I know that you had a couple of um, internships throughout your time at Oklahoma State. Um, tell the listeners a little bit about the different experiences you had before you got out of college. Yeah. Um, so my first internship was with Hayden and Company, and they're a um, industrial fire protection sales company. And so they provide... Uh, just about anything you you could need from from firefighting foam to nozzles, 
deluge valve assemblies, butterfly valves, you name it, they, they can help you. And so uh, that was my first internship. And I, I learned a lot from that. Um, I remember my, my second week there, we put together a whole bunch of deluge valve assemblies. And I remember torquing the bolts down and everything and actually getting to put my hands on it and see what a deluge valve itself was and then a strainer and then the OS and Y's and build the pallets for it and everything. Um, that was really cool. And I got to go to uh, the NFPA conference in 2019 there in San Antonio. So that was a really cool experience being able to see all the other trades there showing off their products and, and innovations in terms of uh, fire protection so that was that was my favorite internship, aside from from one I'll tell you about in a in a minute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh yeah, and, nice. Yeah, yeah. And then my second internship actually got canceled. Uh, so I was going to go to Textron Aviation and work in a environmental health and safety role. Uh, this was actually at the height of COVID in the summer of 2020, and so they ended up canceling the the program that summer. And so I never, I didn't get a chance to go do that. And then what would have been my third internship or technically is my third internship was with FSB architecture and engineering. And so I actually jumped in and got to see the design side of it. Um, and working with the, the plans that actually go into the buildings that, that we build around the nation. And so it, that, that was another great experience. Yeah, so that's a great time to say that, you know, how I know Matt and why it's real easy for me to ask Matt leading questions on some of the cool experiences he has is because uh, Matt was an intern when I was at FSB, and so he got the, see the, you know, he got the brunt of my mentorship <laughs> advice and trying to help him through all of the twists and turns for um, what it means to be a fire protection engineer, but yeah, what did you, so what was your thought about like, you know, was fire protection engineering or the design side of things, what you were thinking it was going to be when you, you know, came to FSB? Um, that, that's a hard one to answer, I, I think, because the the way FSB is structured, I think, is very unique as compared to a lot of other other fire protection design companies. And like, you can do alarm design with with a company, or you can do sprinkler design with a company. Whereas at FSB, it's it's a little bit of everything, you know. Um, so in in terms of FSB, no, it's it's not what I thought. Excuse me, not what I thought it would be. Um, but it's still a very fulfilling and great experience that I've, I've been able to have. Uh, I just, in terms of design, I didn't realize how much actually goes into it and how much thought process has to actually go into it. Whereas I feel like in sprinkler design, you know, that the building has been built and, you know, you can run through, you know, these systems have pretty much been set to a degree and you can just run straight forward and, and design your system. I feel like in the A and E world, things can change. They shouldn't change at any moment, but they could. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you could get down to your 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 deadline a week away, and then somebody comes and says, "Oh yeah, we changed this system." And then you've really got to sit there and, and think about how that one change affects your actual system design. Yeah. And so I I do think that that's a a very unique setup. It is. Yeah, there's definitely something to when, you know, you're working in design, things are still conceptual oftentimes, especially if you're working on new construction. There's not really, it's a pretty like wide range of what you could be dealing with. You know, um, of course, you could have site constraints or um, budgetary restrictions, but a lot of times uh, your imagination is about what you're limited to and the function of the programmatic requirements of the building that you're working on. So yeah, I definitely have been a part of some of those um, big shifts in 
you know, um, building or process or anything you can think of could totally change design and layout much later in the process than those changes should be happening. I'm sure any design or, you know, engineering or architecture professional could, could speak to those pains. So that's a good point (laughs) you bring up. Well, and, and I feel like budgetary, like we, we discussed earlier, budget is also one of those things that kind of really impacts the, the design side of it is, you know, when, when you're doing flow tests and, and you're looking at numbers and saying, hey, a pump may be required, you know, you, you can watch people's hair stand up <laughs> yeah, be, because they, they don't want to put these things in because they're costly. And, and nobody right. likes when you have to put in a costly required, you know, they want the costly option. <laughs> That's true. Um, so I, I think it's one of those interesting aspects of, of A&E that you just got to find a way to work around. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, we were talking a little bit off air about how, you know, budgetary is always a factor, but it's exceedingly a factor with fire and life safety systems because, you know, generally speaking, a lot of people don't think about these systems. And, you know, I mean, your average person might not even know that a fire sprinkler system exists in a building or a fire alarm system, commercial fire alarm system exists in a building. So, uh, you know, when you're working with business owners, um, that aren't huge business owners, like if you're working with, uh, DOD or, you know, some of the more sophisticated commercial building owners, um, they might not even be thinking of these requirements for fire and life safety systems. So I think that's a good point about how, you know, the role of budget and the constraint of budget and the pains of the dreaded term VE um, <laughs> value engineering can be um, excruciating. Mm-hmm. Um, even though there's not so many things that you can do for fire and life safety, but that's a good point, Matt. So what, uh, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, what you your first learning process at FSB, you know, what was some of the biggest parts of the learning curve or things that you remember as like taking a while to get used to or process? Uh, The biggest growing pain was Revit. Uh, I had never done anything with, with Revit. I had no idea the program even existed. Um, I had worked with with AutoCAD and very like one one week in a class with AutoSprink. And then I had taken an entire design course with uh, SolidWorks. So I kind of understood the idea of a 3D program, but truly grasping Revit while trying to use my very preliminary uh, knowledge of fire protection and trying to learn those two things and soak up as much as I can, uh, that was a challenge. Um, I think you remember when I worked on that one project that I, I had spent three days working on the pump room, trying to lay it out and get everything right and, and help. And then somebody walked by my desk and said, hey, did you know this was a phasing project? And I looked, I said, what is phasing? And then, you know, that's when we had found out that everything I had done kind of messed it up a little bit. And so um, it's one of those, I've gotten better about it, about learning to not be afraid to ask those questions, even though they may sound silly in my head, I still ask them because I don't want to run into that situation where I'm spending another four days fixing a mistake because I didn't ask the question. Well, and, you know, that's not all you're bad either because True. phasing is one of the most difficult things to to do in Revit and phasing goes into visibility graphics. And so how you display elements on a sheet, what people see, it's really, a, uh, I would say, an intermediate to an advanced concept. And so for somebody who is, you know, probably a month and a half into an internship, and just picking up a computer program, that's a pretty daunting um, task. So that's not all on you either. And also, I wanted to say that, like, 
and you're a computer guy too. Like you've always Mm -hmm. um, had computers and like good experience with computers. So that's interesting to hear from you talking about like the learning challenge of Revit, even as somebody who, you know, has a fair amount of experience navigating like PCs and computers. Yeah, uh, it, you know, it, it sounds weird when I say this out loud, but even on my end, I dealt with an issue with a, a, a gaming app and where for some reason that gaming app would not work and because there was a conflict between my internet and how that gaming app connected to the system. And so I had to go into my actual um, run or program run software. I can't remember what exactly it's called, um, but... I actually had to go in and actually type out the codes to get it to reset and so that I could get that app to work correctly. And yet Revit is one of those things that's probably one of the more challenging programs to work with. (laughs) It's it's very interesting. Yeah. There's, it's funny because like uh, Revit is something that like to do the basic amount of stuff, like it doesn't take you very long, but then to do some of the advanced concepts or figuring out the different bugs or kind of common pitfalls. It takes years to figure out all the different bells and whistles. So Mm -hmm. it's, that's an interesting thing. So even now I'm going in and and learning kind of how to rework families so that we can use our 3d families and have our, our proper annotations along with those 3d families and, and going in and, and learning how to pair those and, and set it up correctly. That's been a lot of fun, but it's also been a little, a little annoying at times. Oh yeah. I can imagine. I don't even really have any good experience with the family editor at all, though. That's great that you're learning that it's something that is, just uh necessary if you're going to run into a situation in which a family is not working in the way that it's supposed to or maybe you have to problem solve or um it being upgraded or uh, Mm -hmm. any other hundred issues you could run into with the a file not being in the correct format or layout for the project yeah that's awesome man i had a mini heart attack actually last week you know I'm in the middle of working on a project. I had my file name saved as a specific name. And I probably, I think I went an hour and a half without syncing and and saving. And so I decided, I was like, you know what? I'm going to sync and save. Well, I did that. And uh, Revit popped up with a error code that said the central model had been deleted. (laughs) I I about lost it. I I couldn't figure out what I did. I didn't delete anything. And so I I, I went through my, my little process of checking and we found that somebody had renamed my file in the middle of me working on the project. And that actually prevented me from being able to, excuse me, save my progress. Uh, And so we determined that if you just change the file name back, you can, go and actually sync it and save it and do everything you needed to as long as you change it back to that original file path name. So that was an interesting tip I learned. Wow, that's a good one to know. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, so let's talk a little bit about the engineering side of things and like, you know, that learning process and kind of, you know, what you learned or what had a steep learning curve initially for fire protection engineering. And then, uh, yeah. What do you think about from that piece of things? Like, was it codes and standards or was it like just understanding all the industry jargon of, you know, construction documents, design development, like what part of that did you remember kind of like grappling with? I think one of the things that's been the toughest for me to understand is fire alarm. Uh, Kind of understanding how things connect into a fire alarm panel, understanding what different types of signal lines you can have. You know, at school, we take a very early class and and learn briefly about fire alarm and and how to wire up uh, detectors. But 
when you actually get into industry, I feel like it's, it's so much more complex that, and there's so many different systems and some system, some panels don't work with certain devices. Uh, so I feel like that right now for me is one of my biggest learning curves is understanding the, the fire alarm side of, of, of it and understanding what to spec with what, and also federal jobs require different uh, specifications that, you know, they like certain devices to be used and, and we can, we can do that, but understanding the distinction between like a federal job or, or a, a, a private sector job and, and how those devices interact with each other. Um, I think OSU prepared us really well to understand the jargon and, and understand the terms. Uh, and, and I even to a fault forget that a lot of other people don't understand our terms. And so when I'm writing an email or I'm just talking to someone, I'll use our abbreviations and then I'll get the question back. Hey, what does FACP stand for? And then it, it clicks to me like, Oh shoot. You know, they, they don't understand our, our language. And so um, that would probably be another learning curve is understanding that even though I know the abbreviation and the jargon, I've got to spell it out for, for everyone just in case they don't understand the, the shorthand. Yeah, that's a good point, Matt. I think that I'm still struggling with both of those things you're talking about. So that's cool to hear about, you know, kind of your learning process and the different things. I mean, I still have, um, you know, <clears throat> working on understanding, you know, compatibilities, different device types, and understanding what's available commercially off the shelf, what's proprietary, fire alarm manufacturers, and just like the different ins and outs of what different manufacturers offer as far as devices and capabilities. So that's something that um, I've not found easy either. It's just uh, something that you build up over time, this knowledge base and through conversation with different manufacturers and it, you know, like mm -hmm. there's a, a over a half dozen fire alarm manufacturers. So it takes a while to even run into all those different types of panels and, you know, and then you get, <coughs> excuse me, then you get old systems that are deprecated or, you know, they might not even make them anymore. You know, mm -hmm. I've been in old buildings where they have fire alarm panels that like this uh, does not exist anymore. So. Uh, right. We're definitely not maintaining this thing. So, well, there's also uh, understanding like the the local codes and standards too. So even after you've you've wrapped your head around all the different manufacturers and, and all their their inner workings as far as what's compatible with what, then you have local codes and standards where uh, certain jurisdictions, you know, they want say one inch conduit or or half inch conduit specifically, and so. It's one of those where there's a lot to the fire alarm that that you could miss, and they're they're little details. They're not you know blaringly obvious ones. Yeah, that's true. Those understanding the different pitfalls of different jurisdictions is something that is by no means easy, and so I it's uh, that's a hard fought battle, you know, starting early and often to coordinate with the authorities having jurisdiction on preferential things, you know, maybe it's not even spelled out in a very convenient place for you to find with that information for the project you're working on. So I've definitely uh, seen that it's something that, you know, get building that subconscious, um, you know, reminder where you run into certain coordination topics and you're like, oh, this is my list of six or seven different things that I need to follow up with the building owner and with the different regulatory entities and also thinking about insurance requirements. So just all of the different stakeholders in a project that can be the AHJ, that is something that is a real finesse of somebody who has been in the industry a long time when they have a good handle on all those factors. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So tell me a little bit about um, the different kinds of professional society involvement that you have been a part of. I know that we both just had the chance to go 
participate in an SFPE event, but yeah, what kind of different um, organizations have you been a part of over the years? So when I was in school, um, kind of finding my way, I was, I was obviously, I was with the fire protection society for a really long time. Uh, and then I joined, uh, what was, I can't, I don't know what it is now. Is it ASSE or is it, it's, it's American it's society. ASSP of Safety Engineers. Now. Oh, is it ASSP now? Okay. Well, yeah, I think it was ASSE, <laughs> but I think it's ASSP cause they changed it to professionals. I don't know. I'll yeah. look it up and throw it in the show notes. I don't know either. I, yeah, did, I, I think it's changed like three times. Honestly, I think it, right. I think it was something even different than when I first came to the program and then it changed to E and then now P or something. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was a part of that for, uh, two, two or three semesters. And then finally my last semester, I decided to join SFPE since I knew I was going into a design role with an architecture firm. Uh, and so, um, this past year, I've been a part of the SFPE chapter in Oklahoma City, and that that's kind of my start right now. Uh, I'm in the process of trying to get certifications, uh, so just kind of be a part of those different processes. Yeah, and you've been working on studying for your FE and plugging mm-hmm. away and studying just some professional credentialing you've been working on. Right. So, um, with, well, and you know, this with our degree, we can get our GSP. And so I just need to submit a couple more things and I'll get my GSP, which is the graduate safety professional. Uh, and then, uh, I'm in the process of, of studying for my FE with the eventuality of getting my PE Uh, and another certification I'm trying to go for and build up the repertoire and experience is my IHMM, which is an industrial hazardous materials manager. Um, Oh, very cool. Yeah. I remember, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it's, it's one of those certifications that I really like. That was one of my other favorite classes was hazmat. And so there, there was a project when, when you worked at FSB that came in when I was an intern uh, that was actually one of my favorite projects to work on it, you know, had a bunch of different materials on it and going through and meticulously deciding what the classifications of all the materials were. It's, it's a giant puzzle to me. And <laughs> I love solving puzzles. So, yeah, that's great. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Hazmat is a lot of fun and I've seen that IHMM uh, professional society before. It looks like a good one. Um, I just had a project recently, maybe I bet you'd like to hear about it. It was, uh, I went through like an Excel spreadsheet for like, uh, I think it was like over 200 different materials and had to go through that whole process again, but it was like a, a speed run because, um, the building owner had, you know, we had explicitly removed this work from our contract the building owner had said, Oh no, no, we'll take care of it. You know, we'll classify it. We have all the information. Well then, uh, you know, over a year later, they had still not classified the information. And so we were not able to complete the job. And so finally we had been kind of pulled or dragged into the process of, um, you know, doing this hazardous materials determination and, um, doing this huge spreadsheet worth of work. So, I went Mm -hmm. through that whole process again um, and was trying to find different ways to automate it and working through this spreadsheet, but it was a real behemoth and it ended up eating a full weekend and then probably like almost a week worth of just like slugging away, classifying hazmat stuff. But yeah, that's some good old fashioned fire protection engineering fun for you. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, so I always like to ask people, oh, oh yeah, I remember I wanted to double back and talk about, for, you know, for the people, I know what kind of project work you've been involved in and mm-hmm. you know, just from a high level, like what kind of different industries have you had the opportunity to work in and so far in your career? Um, well, yeah, you, you know this cause 
uh, you were a really good mentor to me and still are. <laughs> Man, I'm uh, glad that I just slipped you that 20 bucks before this podcast right? for you to yeah, say no that. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, aviation with a little bit of introduction to hangars, uh, some federal work, uh, the uh, I think the civic market, so like schools and high rises, uh, a couple of Native American projects those have been really cool so far um right now that's been my main exposure i know that um yeah i think that's i'm trying to think back to my old presentation that i gave when i was an intern and you know i I can't it's i'm not being able to recall it right now but oh yeah i understand it's really just like it's hard to remember the projects that aren't within the last two, three months and like right. you know, that have been swallowing all your time. Seems like uh, I bet you've touched almost from what I remember from your presentation, you touched all the market sectors like so Native American, civic, aviation, Department of Defense, infrastructure yeah. and technology. Like I'm pretty sure you had jobs in each one of those. So. Yeah, just kind um, but, of touching a little bit of everything and, and dipping my toes. But I know the last six or last five months have been primarily um, aviation, DOD, and um, the the civic market with schools and high rises. That's awesome, man. That's good stuff. Well, I like to kind of plug people at the end of the podcast for – you know, professional development topics. And you've um, talked a little bit about your experience and the learning curve, but I'd love to hear about, you know, what piece of advice you would give to individuals getting into the industry? How would you learn different? um, You know, what tips would you give people? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the tips I would give is is find a mentor who's who's willing to provide you with as much information as they can. You know, an individual like the host of this podcast, Mr. Whoa. Gus, he, he's he's great at being able to disseminate that information when you have a question. But there's also you can go and read code. Um, code is going to give you a very prescriptive way of doing things, but honestly going and finding blogs or even uh there are i I think i found a couple of uh individuals on youtube who can kind of teach you how to run through calcs um one of my favorite blogs that i've been going to is the meyer fire blog Uh, and they even have a uh, training academy i think is what they call it or meyer fire university that you can can use and they have a bunch of different videos that go over design scenarios now that's that's something that I've been looking into here lately and really just asking questions um, being new you kind of get a free pass <laughs> where you can you can kind of say hey I've never experienced this before could you explain to me what this piece of equipment is or what this does or uh, like in terms of HVAC like uh, how do these systems work you know where what is a doaz I had no idea what a doaz unit was and it's a dedicated outside air system. And the way I learned that was just by asking the question. Uh, so mm-hmm. that, that would be my advice is don't be afraid to ask a question, even though you may say it in your head and say, oh, this sounds silly. Like, how would no one know this? Sometimes people don't know it. And, and it's OK to to genuinely ask to one better yourself and understanding the topics and. Uh, grow as a young professional yeah i agree it's hard it's really feels embarrassing and it feels just like you don't want to you know project that out into the room but honestly and i'm still even talking to myself at this moment because i still get into situations where you know even if it's not technical stuff even if it's just like hey you know I'm not sure who all stakeholder wise is on this meeting, you know, would everybody mind introducing themselves or, you know, something like that. So it doesn't have to be technical. It can be business related. It can be just as a component of your job or your work. Um, it's, it's better to ask a question and to walk through it with people than to just move on and then, you know, 
have people figure it out later that you were completely ignorant of what's going on. So mm-hmm. um, it's that's a hard line to straddle, but yeah, that's a good piece of advice, Matt. Um, but um, another thing I always like to get a sense of from people, and we talked a little bit about, you know, the role of budget, and um, we talked also off air about just um, people's seeming kind of hesitance for, you know, what will come of the economy as being factors for what's going on in the industry. But yeah, what kind of other trends are you seeing for fire and life safety or for the architecture, engineering and construction industry? Oh, well, I mean, this is something that you and I are very aware of is, is the move away from, from foams that have PFAS or PFOA in them. Um, I'm actually going down to a seminar uh, here in a couple of weeks, actually, to learn how to design flooring-free foam systems. Uh, that seems to be one of the really big hot-button topics right now. And I think something else that I've kind of noticed is the move towards CPVC pipe and as a substitution to regular galvanized steel or um, traditional like schedule 10 or schedule 40 piping, uh, seeing as it is a pretty big cost cut to be able to do CPVC at a time when there are supply chain shortages and very long lead time items. Um, I, I think that's something I've noticed on, on quite a few projects so far where they, they're wanting to opt in for CPVC, which is, uh, got its own kind of, uh, nuances to tackle in terms of how to install it and it's it's a very interesting trend that i think is going to be kind of kind of continuing for the next few years until we can really get the supply chain shortages figured out yeah that makes sense that's a good point that you bring about the different kind of pit pitfalls and different code implications of using cpvc piping yeah, I've had a couple of um, jobs, um, commercial jobs and just residential jobs that have used CPVC. And also when I was working at a fire suppression firm and working on res- residential jobs and designing jobs that have CPVC, you know, uh, I have mixed feelings about it. I feel like uh, because mm-hmm. I understand the cost consideration, but also... I understand that the there are some definite disadvantages to it. So it's a good point. There's some real pros and cons to CPVC piping. Mm-hmm. But anyways, Matt, well, that's all I got for you, big dog. Um, anything else that you want to talk to or any questions for me? I know I kind of put <laughs> you on the spot with this whole interview, so I really appreciate you bailing me out. but. Oh, you're yeah, okay. anything else you want to cover? Uh, no, I mean, you know me, I'll probably text you with a question on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but, you know, I think that is one thing is if you can find a mentor who will be that person that you can just shoot a text to and, and heck, even if they respond to you within a week, you found a good mentor. Um, the, I think that's that's if you can find that, that's going to be one of the biggest benefits as as a young engineer and a young professional. Yeah, that's a good point. It's um, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. It's like you need to find somebody who is a uh, professional fit, so they're doing the same job as you, and then you also have to find somebody that you have similar communication and learning styles from. So I feel like we are geared in a similar way for like learning style. So Mm -hmm. um, it's just something that uh, is not easy or intuitive to do to find somebody to help kind of talk you through different stuff, but it can be a huge help for, there are some things that are just not explicitly spelled out, whether it's the business part or the technical part. And so Years of experience are a great tutor, but anytime you can lean on people, there is absolutely no shame in it. And I can promise you, 
if somebody has the capability to answer, they are going to want to do that for you. They're not going to want you to just suffer through something that they can, you know, point you in the right direction of. Um, so that's a great point, Matt. Or they well, can tell you, did, or they can ask you, did you read the code? <laughs> yeah, or they can say, did you check here, here, and here first? Right. Which, I mean, you know, some stuff you just can't, you just can't answer. You just got to go, you know, run it, run it to ground and, you know, oh, about yeah. six different places. But, you know, if it's clear and it's obvious, it's always uh, good to try to reach out to somebody who's been through it before. But anyways, man, well, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for coming on. It was a great app. Yeah, anytime. Thanks for listening, everybody. Be sure to share the episode with a friend if you enjoyed it. Don't forget that fire protection and life safety is serious business. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are by no means a professional consultation or a codes and standards interpretation. Be sure to contact a licensed professional if you are getting involved with fire protection and or life safety. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. (laughs) 